Hello guys, hope you are well. Glad to have you back here talking Arsenal. I don't know about you, I'm feeling a bit of FOMO right now um, because Arsenal have flown out on their US tour. Tour squad was announced, I think they flew out on Sunday and this time last year I flew out on that tour as well. I had a brilliant time covering the club in Baltimore and in Florida. Oh man, it was one of the best experiences of my time covering Arsenal, meeting all the fans in the States, the fans who had travelled from the UK, from elsewhere, come from all over America to see Arsenal. And it was just like a festival, a non-stop party. And there were some pretty good football matches squeezed in too. I'm not there this year uh, for reasons, the same reasons in fact that on my table next to me here I have a book called Peekaboo Lion. Um, not my usual read but you know there's a baby in the house and that's why I'm sticking around but there's a lot of FOMO let me tell you. So today I'm going to be talking a bit about why that tour was so important to Arsenal last season and why I think it can be really important to the season to come as well. Before we get into that um, we're going to round up sort of general news, a bit of transfer stuff, I should probably address the fact that I haven't got a beard anymore. Um, it, I had it shaved off for an acting job. Um, I, I'm less a fan of this look, although people point out more often that I look like my baby. Um, I think that's because, to be honest, I just look quite like a baby like this. Um, you can't underestimate how much that's playing into things. I'm certainly meeting him halfway in the like lookalike stakes. Um, in football news, uh, I saw a story by The Athletic today that Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang is in talks with Marseille about potentially leaving Chelsea to go to Marseille. And I think I'm right in saying I read that there's a three-year deal on offer. And I was completely taken aback by that. I mean, Aubameyang has looked a, a kind of a player very much at the end of his career. To offer him three years at this point in time really, really came as a shock to me. Um, seems like people just don't learn their lesson. But then you do think, well, it is Liga, And you look at how Alexandre Lacazette was revitalised playing back in France last season. Maybe a similar thing could happen to Aubameyang. I think the level's not quite as high there. Maybe he'll flourish. I um, have to say, you know, although their Arsenal careers maybe didn't fulfil all their potential or certainly end as we might have hoped in the case of Aubameyang, I would derive some pleasure from seeing uh, Oba and Laka tearing it up in Liga uh, next season. Another player who tore it up in Liga is Flo Balogun. Uh, last season had a fantastic loan spell at Reims and um, the latest reporting suggests that Inter Milan are hot on his tail. Some suggestions of a 40 million euro offer. I don't know if it's actually reached a kind of formal club to club offer yet, but one is anticipated uh, in the coming days of around that mark. Arsenal would like, you know, more like 50 million for the player. If Milan come in at 40 million, let's say, euros, you could, and I, should, I call them Milan there, I should absolutely call them Internazionale or Inter Milan, they won't have liked that. Uh, you could see a deal being struck there, you could see a compromise potentially being reached. It's interesting, we've spoken about the need to sell players within the Premier League. Is Balogun an exception there? Do Arsenal want him joining another Premier League club, uh, potentially playing against them twice a year, potentially you know developing really well and embarrassing them? Uh, I'm not so sure. I think a club like Inter could be the perfect solution in some respects because you get a decent chunk of money for him. Serie A clubs, as I've mentioned time after time, are generally more amenable to things like buyback clauses, uh, sell-on fees. It's more part of their transfer vernacular. Um, so it could be a deal that really suits Arsenal and it means Balogun won't be on their doorstep making them look silly for letting him go, uh, which I think is a very real prospect because he's a very talented player uh, and seems like a young man who absolutely knows what he wants from his career and where he's going, where he's headed. Um, could he still stick around? Maybe. He's on that tour. He looks like he hasn't got a care in the world. He'll play wherever, gives him the opportunity next season. I admire his confidence. I like the swagger. Let's see. Let's see. It feels like a straight fight between him and Eddie. We know how much Arteta likes Eddie. Let's see what he makes of Balogun at close quarters. Um, let's move on to the main topic for the day. Actually, before we do, just a quick note. When I started doing these videos, I asked for 
help to get to 50,000 subscribers and boy did you guys provide it. We have moved way beyond that now. We're well into, you know, 50, I think it's 55, 56,000. I'd love to get up to 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, but before we get anywhere, let's get to 60. So if you're watching these videos, if you are enjoying them, um, please do subscribe. It really does make a massive difference. Let's talk pre-season. And as I say, a year ago, I was out there in America and it was critical because it helped Mikel Arteta find the team that would propel Arsenal to the top of the Premier League table. We played three games, I think, in America. Um, we played in Germany against Nuremberg. That was a bit of a mix and match team, as it was this year. Uh, then we went out there and played Everton. Uh, again, not the strongest 11. Players still coming back, um, still kind of working on their fitness. We played Orlando. And that was a really hodgepodge team. I mean, just to read you the outfielders for that game, we had a back four of Tavares, Pablo Marie, Rob Holding and Cedric Suarez, a midfield three of Albert Sambi, Lekonga, Mohamed Elneny and Ainsley Maitland-Niles, and a front three of Eddie Nketiah, Gabriel Martinelli, who of course, you know, he's a first team starter, and Nicola Pepe. So a long way from the team that would actually start the season. But the third of those games was against Chelsea. And that was, I think, the first time we saw the starting eleven that we'll probably forever associate with Arsenal's 22-23 campaign. Ramsdale in goal, Ben White at right back, Saliba in alongside Gabriel, uh, Zinchenko at left back. He arrived, of course, during that US tour com coming over from the Man City camp. They were also in America. Midfield three, party at the base, Shaka more advanced, Odegaard in there at the right eight, and up front, Jesus with uh, Martinelli to one side and Saka to the other. And they played Chelsea off the park. 4-0 winners on the day. Cruise control for Arsenal. And it might have been easy to dismiss that as a friendly, but actually, that game, that scoreline, was pretty instructive about both of those team seasons, about where both of those teams were headed. Um, they picked the same team uh, for the following friendly against Sevilla in the Emirates Cup. I think it was a 6-0 win. And then the same team on the opening day against Palace. And it provided the foundations for an outstanding start to the season. Now, the schedule this time is busier. We've got more pre-season games, partly because of our involvement in the Community Shield. We've already played the game in Germany. And then there are three games in America. We've got the All-Star game, uh, which is coming up tonight, uh, overnight if you're in the UK. A Man U friendly and then a Barcelona friendly. And then even beyond that, we got Monaco in the Emirates Cup um, and Mad City in the Community Shield. So, and then Nottingham Forest on the opening day. Plenty of time yet. I think by the time we get to the Barcelona game, the last friendly of Arsenal's pre-season tour of the States, I think Mikel Arteta will have a pretty clear idea in his mind who's going to play against Nottingham Forest on the opening day. It would not surprise me if the starting eleven we see against Barcelona is the same one we see at Wembley in the Community Shield and the same one we see uh, in the Emirates Cup and possibly the same one we see on the opening day at Nottingham, against Nottingham Forest, hosting Nottingham Forest. Listen, uh, injuries permitting, fitness permitting, I think there's a very real prospect of that. Um, so there's the selection element, right? The cohesion of the team. Um, our players going to have to get used to new positions. Ben White had to become accustomed to being a right back. Kai Havertz is going to have to become accustomed to being a left eight. Lots of things like that to keep an eye on and that's going to make this a really fascinating period. A couple of other quick points on why I think pre-season is so important, can be so important for Arsenal this year. Last year, um, Martin Odegaard was named club captain and that tour period really saw a couple of players step up to the plate and emerge as vice captains. And I think it was even decided or announced internally by the start of the season that Granit Xhaka and Gabriel Jesus would be Martin Odegaard's vice captains. Arsenal don't like the idea of vice captains. They prefer, they don't like the, the language rather. They prefer kind of shared leadership or, or leadership group or deputies to Odegaard. But 
what happened there was there was a change in the hierarchy of the captaincy and everything evolved over that tour period. And Gabriel Jesus, who'd been at the club for a matter of weeks by that time, very, very, very quickly became a leader, became central to the squad. And I think there are players within this group who have the opportunity to do that this time around. Granit Xhaka has moved on. Again, there's a bit of a vacuum there, a bit of a, an empty space for someone to step into, to fill that breach, to become a leader. You all know what I'm going to say. Declan Rice absolutely could be that man. Um, I loved, by the way, the Mikel Arteta quotes, calling him a lighthouse for the other players. You know, it's funny, these guys are retired athletes, coaches, they're not poets, but sometimes they choose a phrase so aptly. I'm like, well, whoever's writing Mikel Arteta's scripts really knows what he's doing. I thought that was beautiful to call Rice a lighthouse, but he's not the only one. Bakayo Saka, I think, is someone who could step up in this period, who could um, replace Shaka in that leadership group, who could be a, a key part of that contingent moving forward. And I'd throw Zinchenko into the mix as well. To be honest, I think he probably already is considered to be among that leadership group, but um, I think he might become all the more so because he's been so important since he came in. And then lastly, and this is something maybe as fans we don't give much consideration, but something that can really bond a squad together and that can be hugely valuable in difficult moments is the social dynamic, the social aspect. And to be to be fair to Shaka, this was something that he was very good at, you know, organising a team meal, organising uh, a family barbecue with the players and their families or a, a team night out. He played a pretty key role in all those things during his time at Arsenal. But all these new players, Rice, Timber, um, Kai Havertz, Flo Balogun, for example, I saw him next, sat next to Bukai Saka on the plane. He's got to reintegrate for however long he's still here. All those new players have to find their new little kind of niche in the squad. The guys they're going to sit with on the plane, on the bus, uh, the guys who are going to sort of support them over the next 12 months. And how that group click together uh, as a whole, how those kind of... Um, I'm not going to use the word cliques because that sound too, sounds too negative, too pejorative, but how the different social groups, the different nationalities in some ways, um, blend and combine, can be integral. It can be critical, really, to the success of any team. And I'm sure it's something that Arteta will be really mindful of. You know, last year on the tour, they did things like mixing up the table plans every single day so that players, and not just players, staff, were forced to sit with each other, converse, and build the bonds that would sustain them over the following, what, eight months or so. Um, I think that's another important element to these tours that can't be overlooked. And I think it's part of the reason that managers accept them because it can be such a bonding experience. Let's leave it there. Um, this has been a good long video. Thank you so much for watching, listening. I know that some of you have asked for these to be available as podcasts. It's something I'm giving some thought to. Obviously I'm on a lot of podcasts already. So doing these videos was partly about doing sort of a different format, a different medium. Um, but we'll see how we go. If, demand for it continues I'll certainly look into it um, but yeah thank you for watching those of you on YouTube like subscribe comment let me know what you want what you want to watch what you want to see and uh, if you're in the States for the tour have a blast and if you're not we'll all share in that FOMO together and talk about it here uh, on the YouTube channel cheers guys speak to you all soon bye bye